Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Dress and Drinks. My name is Leon Webers. I'm glad to have you all here today um, as we have another episode of Dress and Drinks. Um, the Costume Society of America thanks you for joining us in today's program um, and in our series Conversations on Dress. I'm really excited to welcome you all today. Again, I'm Leon Webers. I'm a professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University. And today we have with us a wonderful speaker, Hunter Old Elk from the Plains Indian Museum at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Um, Hunter Old Elk is the assistant curator of the Plains Indian Museum, a Smithsonian affiliate located in the Wyoming Yellowstone region. Hunter Old Elk is Crow and Yakima and grew up in the Crow, on the Crow Indian Reservation in southeastern Montana. She earned a bachelor's degree in art with a focus in Native American history at Mount St. Mary's University in, Mar in Maryland. Old Elk uses museum engagement through object curation, exhibition development, social media, and education to explore the complexities of historic and contemporary indigenous culture. Visitors of the Plains Indian Museum can learn about the construction, availability of materials, tribal belief systems, and, and stylistic significance through their work. The Plains Indian Museum dress is vibrant and full of life with beautiful colors and materials. And she's especially inspired by the stories of Native American women who lived and thrived on the Plains and is particularly excited to talk about ethically purchasing Native fashion. So, um, we welcome her to our program and to Costume Society. Our cocktail for the evening is the Buffalo Bill cocktail, and the non-alcoholic version is the Old Fashioned Mocktail. So, Hunter, please join us uh, and turn your camera on, and we'll get things rolling. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh, my hi. goodness. It's so awesome to share space with you all. It's so great to have you. It is so wonderful. Yes. It's been a little bit of a time since we had our conversation in Cody. Oh, what was that? A while ago? So yeah, it should have been this last spring. Um, yes. I'm so excited to be in this space. Um, one thing I'm extra excited about in um, sharing is I just completed my master's in cultural heritage management at Johns Hopkins University. Um, so that needs to be added to my bio at some point. <laughs> Fantastic, um, and congratulations. Thank you, yeah, so I graduated technically in May, but I, I completed the program, so I'm very excited to um, have some time to be able to do more presentations and um, spend some more time with my family. So. Fantastic, and we're we're so happy that you're here and we're excited to see what you have to show us today. Uh, we look forward to this conversation. I had a great pleasure of visiting um, the Plains Indian Museum when CSA Western Region Conference uh, Symposium was there last spring. And the, the, the objects that you have are just stunning. And I was super excited to be able to connect with you and and invite you to the program and to highlight the work that you're doing. So um, we're really, really excited. So why don't we dive in and we'll have a conversation about the pieces. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Yes, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so if you'll give me a second, I'd love to introduce myself. Um, so Vishoda Balaja Bia Basana Hook Balaja of Salagya Kuk Balaja Yakma. So my name is Hunter Old Elk. Um, and I am from the Crow tribe. Um, my mother is Yakima, but I was raised on the Crow tribe on the Crow Indian Reservation. Um, my name in my community is Woman in the Front. Um, and so that was a name that was given to me when I was an infant. Um, and in my community at, at, of the Ipsalaya Nation, um, we live up to our names. Um, it's something that is invoked on you at a young age and then um, you 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 live live within the the realms of, of the story that's associated with that. Um, my English name, um, American name is Hunter Old Elk. Um, I use she her pronouns. Um, you're welcome to call me Hunter. Um, that's something I'm proud to have all of my names. Um, for those that might not have access to camera or may have visual um, impurities, um, I'm about five eight. Um, I have dark brown hair, um, brown eyes, and um, I'm currently sitting in my office at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Um, so to give you kind of a background of where I'm at and um, 
some some components about myself. So um, for today's presentation, um, I'd love to talk about the collection and basically what we do in engaging with communities. And then after, um, I'd love to provide a list of some of the up and coming um, and very successful native um, designers that I follow. And so I'd love to use that as an opportunity. I didn't present their specific artwork in my presentation only because I think it's really up to our audiences to go out and seek what, what they find as the best. Um, you know, I'm not the type of person to say like, this is my favorite, this is not my favorite. You know, like I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to, to make those assessments. However, I will say that the native fashion world is emerging. Um, they're coming in strong um, and unapologetically, so much so that um, I'm sure many of you have followed along with um, the story of what Lily Gladstone has been doing um, and her work with the um, uh, Killers of the Far Moon um, and her recent uh, recognition for that. And so there's been so much involvement. Um, Chris Allor is with Vogue um, and he is um, a Nashinabe, I believe. Um, and so he's, you know, an indigenous journalist who is presenting content at a really high level. And so I definitely encourage the audience to reach out and to look at the work that he's doing. Mm -hmm. One day it's going to be spring in the Mountain West. <laughs> so I picked colors that hopefully um, will invoke spring very soon. Yeah. It's I'm zooming in from Minneapolis and we just came through the blizzard. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we've we've continued to get snow and whatnot. So today I want to talk to you about the power of functionality in art. You know, at its foundation, the Plains Indian Museum represents the cultures and cosmologies, worldviews, and belief systems of many different nations um, throughout the United States and Canada. And so one thing we in a conversation that we often have, um, we think about like, what is art, right? What, what, who defines art and in what way is art um, uh, invoked in those ways? And so for many tribal nations, you have to consider that the clothing that we have in museums were functional, right? They had multiple uses. And so not often would you consider that individuals would have pieces of clothing that were just sometimes used for specific ceremonial spiritual uses, but you have everyday clothing. And so that was a conversation that Lee and I, Lee, Leon and I had this spring where it's interesting to consider that in museums, museums have a, a tendency of cherry picking the most beautiful things, right? So when you had multiple individuals that were going out in communities, purchasing for whatever reason or the, the many reasons that collections came into museums, they often pick the most beautiful things. Um, but there's also this idea that things have to be functional, right? So this is a dress here that I wanted to show, um, and this is the capstone of what it means to be a Crow woman, um, and that is the culture that I belong to. And so this is an elk tooth dress. Um, and the dress itself is constructed of wool material, which was a trade item. Um, and it has a combination of elk ivory and bone that has been carved to look like um, ivories. Um, and so a dress like this is just, it's, they're auspicious. They're, they're absolutely phenomenal in the way that elk only have two ivories. And so to cover a full woman's dress, it takes 500 ivories to do so. And so these are symbols of status. So we have to consider, right, when we are working with different communities that we are not basing status on a Western view, right? It's not the consideration of who has the most money in the bank, who has the biggest houses. It is whose family can provide in the way that they can. And so when you see something like an elk tooth dress, an elk tooth dress is a status symbol. And so we see that with many of the accoutrements and the clothing that we work with. So I want to go on a journey just for a second, um, because we're going into a weekend, um, a family weekend. We're coming into spring. The equinox just happened. There's going to be a, an eclipse happening in two weeks. And that's just a lot of stress. And so if you guys will offer me just three minutes, three minutes to go on a journey, I'm going to ask you to just stop, breathe, and listen. 
So for me, it's the end of the day. Sometimes I catch myself going like this, scrunching up my shoulders all the way up to my ears. And I just want you to just unclench your jaw. Okay, just unclench your jaw. Drop your shoulders, right? Do you feel like your shoulders are all the way up to the top of your ears? Place your feet flat on the ground, right? I, I tend to lean. I sometimes end up going this way or that way. And if you're safe, if you feel like you want to participate, if, if that is something that you feel like you want to do, close your eyes. Close your eyes with me. And let's go on a journey. Let's think about a place, a place that is yours, right? That this is, this is the place that when things are stressed out, you might live there, you might travel there. This might just be a place in your figment of imagination that you go to. Where is it? Can you see it? If you reach out your hand, can you feel it? Is it warm? Is it cold? Is there snow on the ground? What are the elements that make up this community in this place? Is it loud? Are there multiple people? Are you private? Are you in your own setting? Okay, come back to me. Okay, so when I do this exercise, I often think of the mountains. The mountains that my people come from. Um, so my people are from the southeastern Montana, um, well, what is now considered southeastern Montana. Um, but we lived in the Bighorn Mountain Range. And so many of the items that belonged in those clothing came from organic material, right? That, that they lived within the culture and they adopted the cultures that they use. And so as costume designers, you have to consider the availability of materials. And so that is something that's really important to consider. And so when I talk about the Plains Indian Museum, that's a tangible place, right? It's a physical place. Um, it's a place that represents multiple nations, multiple cultures. Um, we just happen to be located in Cody, Wyoming in the Yellowstone ecosystem. We have to consider that the United States and Canada has been home to tens of thousands, if not millions of people for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and currently, as it stands, the United States is home to 566 federally recognized tribes. So these are tribes that the United States deems as tribal nations. There's, I believe, at least 200 state um, and non-federally recognized tribes. And so there's well over 700 tribes in the United States who have their own worldviews, cosmologies, belief systems, the same can be said in, in Canada with the First Nations. There's currently 630 First Nations tribes in Canada. Well, here at the Plains Indian Museum, we represent about 127 nations that lived within the Plains or were forcibly moved because of colonization. So that's about 127 nations from the Saskatchewan River in Canada down to the Rio Grande. And through many different con conditions, um, and for reasons that many collections come into institutions, ethnographic collections come into institutions, we've amassed about 10,000 of those items. Um, and so that is a lot of what the care that I do is um, we have about 9% of our collections on view, and then the other percentage is in a vault storage. And so that represents clothing, tools, items of accoutrement and personal use, um, horse gear. It also represents um, different tools. Did I say tools? I think I said tools. Um, and then also represents uh, cultural and spiritual items that would belong in ceremony. Um, and then we have um, many lithics. And so in that 10,000 collection, I didn't consider lithics. So that would be like archaeology pieces. So we have a lot to take care of. Um, and there's two of us, which I think we do a pretty good job. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and so at the Buffalo Center of the West, we actually have um, 48,000 collections. Um, and so there's the five, we have five curators, and we have a research library that's non circulating. And so I have two anxiety attacks about a year. Um, these are ones that I like, I think my think myself into anxiety. Uh, the first is that I live in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and Yellowstone is the largest active volcano in the world. 
<laughs> um, and then the second is that we have the McCracken Research Library, um, which is a non-circulating library. Um, and they have, I believe, like 3 million collections. And it was estimated that they have a million works on paper that need to be processed. Wow, that's amazing. And then I, think, um, I work with ethnographic museums and, and you know, like, <laughs> and uh, um, works on paper are not my thing. So then I work myself out of that anxiety. So one thing to consider, and this is a conversation that I think often comes up a lot of times in museums, is who are the creators of these, these collections? Um, who is being represented in different collections? Um, who, whose stories are being told? And so one thing that I think we don't and do have a, have a problem with is that women are the creators of 90% of the collections, indigenous collections that we have at the Plains Indian Museum. Um, that said, due to collecting policies, ethnographic policies, their names are often not recorded or their stories. And so you have these incredible individuals, these artisan creators who are creating things for their families, creating things for recognition, but their names are not often recorded, which is too bad. Um, and second to that is that you have to consider also that when you have individuals who lived in societies prior to colonization, like they were creating things for their own survival, right? And so they have to have a functional use. So this is where we get to the idea of who are the creators and how are they doing that? So we have the idea that the role of play is foundational to many tribal communities. And the idea that um, many tribal nations uh, considered gender specific roles. And so um, in my tribe specifically, the Crow tribe, um, children belong to the mother until they were five years old. And so boys, would belong to the mother and the aunt. And then at five years old, that's when they would end up going and they would start to take on the role of men as caretakers and hunters. But women ended up always taking on this idea of caretaking. And so this is a really great juxtaposition of why play is important. And so I you know, spend a lot of time with children um, because I wanna understand the way that they navigate the world, right? And so mm -hmm. toys, um, are foundational to um, this process, this process of, of individuals. Um, and so here on the left, you have um, a hide toy teepee, which is showing an account of war. And it beautifully is juxtaposed next to um, these little girls. These are Cheyenne girls. Um, and they have their little home, their little play home set up in front of them that they're playing with their dolls. And this is showing life skills. Right. And so these girls are learning individual life skills, navigation, um, problem solving, but they're also learning how to set up their own lodge and take care of their own homes. So it's really beautiful. So play is an important part um, in learning technique. That's amazing. That's really wonderful. Yeah, so I wanted to include this, this component because a lot of times when I listen to presentation, we focus on the awesome art of creators, but we also have to consider the art of children, right? Like children need to be modeled, but also at a very young age, this is when these girls are learning how to create items, right? So, yes, exactly. So may I ask a question here? So mm -hmm. the, the, the toy TV that you're showing with the wonderful drawing on it, um, you're saying that, that that drawing and that work is done by the children themselves. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, it's done by the children. Um, so typically, this kind of representational art is done by males. Um, and so this is showing an account of a male in battle. And so likely a woman created, um, well, not likely, a woman created the toy TV itself. But then you have this this account. And so it's, it's showing this inner relationship between boys and girls as well. Awesome. Quite special. It's like, in some ways, it's sort of like a sampler that in, in Western culture, embroidery samples, the techniques that young girls would learn um, as they were learning how to sew. Exactly. Yeah, you have to. I mean, we've all, we have all had practice. Um, uh, I, I can make dresses, but I'm nowhere near an expert that my grandma is, right? <laughs> and so she started us out really young, learning how to bead, learning how to just navigate uh, the dexterity pieces of being able to sew and bead. Um, I still can't sew a straight line on a sewing machine, but don't 
tell her that. <laughs> um, so where do we go from here, right? I've talked a little bit about what we do at the institution, but you have to consider that in, in a world of 2024, Native people are incredibly loud, we're incredibly vocal, we advocate for the things that we want, um, and we're really confronting this idea of colonialism, right? And so museums oftentimes and throughout history are the repositories of conflict. And that's, that's, that's the best way I can explain that. Um, and so you have to consider like the degradation that colonialism has done to many institutions and, and indigenous people throughout the world, right? You have these researchers coming into tribal communities globally and saying, hey, let me extract these elements of your culture and take it back. Or we have colonial um, bodies that are going into communities and degradating in other ways, and then they end up being um, uh, treasures of war. And so for many cases, you have to consider like, when you have living, breathing people, and consider the impact of, of descendants, right? Descendant communities. In a perfect world, I would say, and it might make me an alternative museum person, but the objects that we steward would be better cared for in their own communities. But because of processes, because of um, legal property and ownership, we end up being the caretakers. And that's a role we don't take lightly. So, right, like true decolonization would literally, in my definition, mean burning the whole institution down. <laughs> I don't want to do that, right? Like we're not we're not promoting arson here. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I mean that. Oh yeah, I mean, yes. like this is a great, this is a fabulous conversation oh. and idea to think about in that way of, you know, that that beyond you know giving things back or you know uh, returning things to where they are or their original owners, where do we go now with that? What is and and where are we moving to, in thinking about how do we steward these things now without burning the institution down? How do we partner in that way? I think this. This is a conversation that has been coming in museum circles for quite some time, but certainly now it is really on the forefront um, and, uh, and, and museums around the country are thinking about ways of really um, beyond repatriation, but respect and, and engagement in that way. And, and you're, you're, you, I think you are, are hitting it right on the head. And, and no, and it, it is it is truly this this whole process. And so I'm for the promotion of indigenizing narratives, um, but that has to start at a very like top end level, right? So people like me need to be in these kind of positions. They need to be holding board positions um, uh, in co consultation from all aspects, right? And so that is just the inclusion. I see somebody who's talking about um, language, right? Like these narratives also need to be happening in, in languages themselves. And so how do we do that? Um, we engage audiences and stakeholders in a lot of different ways. At its foundation, reciprocity is our foundation, right? And so we have a cultural advisory group, um, an advisory of elders who direct us on all aspects in decision making. Um, have to recognize first and foremost that we're not the owners. We're not the owners, but we are the stewards of these collections. And again, that they would always be better served and better taken care of in their communities. Um, and to understand that the narratives that we tell remain the intellectual property of those tribal members, past, present, and future. So at the Plains Indian Museum, we use a first person narrative system. It is in English, but we are working to make sure um, to include tribal languages within that narrative. Um, and to understand that like that IP will always belong to those people and that, that those language holders, which is really like kind of burns down the foundation of property law when you consider yeah. the acquisition process. Um, uh, and that it's a privilege. It is an absolute privilege to take care of tribal collections, right? Like this is something that I wake up every single day and, and recognize how um, the, the conflict and, and the, the weight that it means to do so. 
Um, and to say that compliance and ethical practice is the baseline, right? Like that is just the, the absolute bottom line for, for what we can do. Um, and so we have to go beyond the bare minimum of just being in compliance with federal laws, but to also like consider indigenous care techniques, consultation, counsel, consider backgrounds and consider um, like uh, specific uh, navigation of gender um, we don't store children's items next to war items, right? We don't store men's items with women's items. Um, we absolutely do not store items that belong in ceremony um, with our other collections. And so we're lucky because we have um, four ball spaces that we can accomplish oh, this type of storage. Um, I wish we could all be like the Smithsonian and store things by tribe, um, but Nobody but the Smithsonian has that amount of money or that space to do it. So, <laughs> um, but there is like some more, you know, considerations that I wish we, we were able to include. Um, like we recognize that because we store things by type, like those might have been conflicting. Storing two items together might have come from con conflicting tribes, and so you know we recognize that there's this idea that the the holdings that we steward um, are living and breathing they are created by organic materials from things that were once living and they maintain that spiritual and life form um, and that is something that is very alternative to like a western belief system right i have a question um, yeah. about what, some of the things you just mentioned here i mean the the of course i think the conversation around ownership is one that is very active how is that navigated amongst tribal communities? So if, for example, no, I don't, I'm gonna make up something here on the spot. So if, if within tribal communities, one tribe acquires something from another tribe in any numerous ways, how is quote unquote ownership established or navigated or even discussed within that way? Um, so I think a lot of, to start out with that conversation, um, it has to be a consent informed transaction, right? And so there's some cases um, where you have this idea of reciprocity. And so I've gone into tribal communities and been gifted absolutely just beautiful pieces of art and then later on paid that back. And so it was within the consent of that nation to give something to me. Mm. That said, when we are working with tribal communities and, and the holdings that we have, a lot of times that wasn't consent informed, you know, for, for reasons during the reservation period, um, many of those items came into museum collections out of duress, right? Like at its right. foundation, people are selling their most beautiful things so that they can feed their family, right? And so you have to think about that. But then we have now this, you know, this model where you have working artists who are leading the conversation and saying like, yeah, actually, no, I want my item in your museum, but I want to hold the intellectual property and the rights to it, as you should. I want to be informed of any use moving forward, as you should. Um, and I want to maintain the um, copyright for that, as you should, right? And so, so that there is this transaction where now tribal communities can advocate for for their items now. And so um, we probably don't have a, a lot of time to go into all of the aspects of NAGPRA, Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, but really that is the foundation of what that federal policy is trying to do. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, and so you can invite me back to talk about NAGPRA at some other time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so then to, to get back kind of to our presentation, there's a lot of ways that we do this. And so I talked a little bit about um, narratives. We have to tell empowering narratives. So the picture on the left and the picture on the right are of two, uh, the, the same couple. Does your perception change if I tell you that the picture on the left is of Miss Minnie Hallowood and her husband, Mr. Hallowood, and he's pointing out where his wife was shot and shot at at the Battle of the Little Bighorn? And this is after she had um, fled the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. If I make this statement and I form it in that sense, that's a victim narrative, right? What if I tell you 
that this couple that's standing on the right is the same couple and Miss Minnie Hallowood is wearing a feather bonnet. And she was one of the few individuals, she was a Lakota woman who was married into the Cheyenne tribe of Montana. One of the few women that we have photographic evidence that she earned the right, the R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T, so this ritual right to wear a feather bonnet because of her acts of war, the things that she did in war for her to be able to achieve that. Wow. That's an empowering narrative. Yeah. And so we balance those two, right? We have to say that like certainly when we're talking about these colonial narratives that we're also telling those really awesome stories um, and balancing both of them because, you know, again, then it puts its states and places indigenous people in this victim narrative all the time and, and that's not where we want to be. Well, so, and interestingly, and within this, even without even that the narrative that you shared, the, the 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 facts of these two images, just the images by themselves um have different stories that they're telling and and have different context and 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 support what you're talking about. One one feels very powerful and the other feels more impoverished in a way. It does, yeah. Um, and so these, thank you, thank you for that, that reflection. Um, and I think what's really interesting about these, these images is that um, these were taken in between 1903 and 1925 by Thomas Bailey Marquess on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Um, and so these are individuals that actually witness the Little Bighorn, which is pretty, pretty incredible when you think about that's that. Right? That's one of, one of like the six narratives that you get in the U.S social studies book on indigenous history and um, greasy grass is one of them but it's it's a very intimate picture on the left right like you can see her shoulders are out like her her um, the top of her bosom is is exposed um, and he's pointing directly at her and so you know the impact and consent for those those images is, is really important so just to give you an idea, again, to the, the kind of scope of what we are, are, are caring for, right? So I talked about we present um, kind of the cultures of 127 nations, although we have collections from all over the United States and Canada. Um, this is just a really like loosey-goosey quick search of our database. Um, these are not, they're, they're accurate, but not specifically accurate. So, you know, I, I'll get, I could get accurate numbers from my registrar. Um, but just under the Plains Indian Museum care, we have approximately 500 um, dresses. And so those would include children's um, and girls' dresses as well. Um, when I do the, the search of a hide shirt or a shirt, um, that comes up to about 168. Belt and belt bags um, is 301. We have about 131 pairs of moccasins, 170 pairs of um, leggings. Um, and so when I type in this combination of purse, bag, or pouch, that comes up to about 720 items. And then accessories are necklaces, bracelets, and hair ornaments. Um, there's that number. And then, of course, I included dolls because I talked about um, uh, tools that we, we use for modeling. And so here, um, I'll make sure that we share the link. You can actually view most of these items on our online collections portal. Fantastic. That's amazing. Cool. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of give you an idea of just the scope and size of some of the items that we work with. So um, this is a women's uh, almost fully beaded dress and dress yoke. Um, so each one of these is about a size, uh, I want to say they're about a size 13 bead um, for those that, that do bead working. Um, and this is a, a Lakota dress. The, the cape is fully beaded on both sides. Um, it has the two motifs and then six horses on the back. Um, you want to take a guess at how, and in the chat, you want to take a guess at how heavy this is? <laughs> I'll let for others guess. I'm, I have a, I'm going to yeah, guess. We can, we can take a quick chat and we'll just take, take a quick, quick break. And Throw some ideas in the chat about how much you think yeah. that weighs. In US pounds. 30 pounds. 30 pounds. 50? 50 pounds, 25. I was going to say in that ballpark, 30 to 35 was going to be my guess. 
Yep, so we're really heavy, I can't even guess. <laughs> yeah, so um, KF was pretty close. Um, this dress is 22 pounds. Wow. And so this is one of those items that you have to consider that when collectors were coming through, again, they're picking the, the most incredibly decorated, most, um, uh, the, the, the incredibly decorated items. And so I just love this item because for one, it's, it's quite heavy. Um, for two, it shows the kind of work that it would take um, to, to do something like this. And so that fully beaded cape, um, I don't lane stitch, um, but I know people who do, the, the Lakota people, the Cheyenne people, and the Rappo people are phenomenal, and the Ponca people are phenomenal at it. Um, and something like this could take anywhere from like six to, to eight months to fully complete. Six to eight months? Yes. Wow. That, I mm -hmm. think that's fast, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we also don't have the same kind of distractions that our, our counterparts in the 1900s would have. With, this is true. Know. I was going to say, oh, a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been working um, on some course, quilts like, for my family for about five years now. So Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this item, of course, would be used in special occasions. It'd be a special occasion um, piece. Um, and then so this one is out of order, but it'll be in the right order. I just want to give you an example of um, just the process for which a lot of these came in. And so we, we talked about navigating the reservation period um, and the way that the reservation period really adapted and so this would be a great example of the art that was being created after the reservation period from like the 1880s on um but then you had the role of boarding schools um and the the, the idea of acculturation and so these two pictures um are from the lodge grass community and there was a boarding school that was there um and so you can give an example of how acculturation played into this role and so the woman on the right is sewing on her singer sewing machine and the the image on the left was actually um it was modeled after like county fairs and so this was a contest for who had created the the most beautiful of art um and so here's a couple ideas um, of just our storage um this is a, a large dress really similar to the horse dress that i showed you um in our storage component um also fully beaded um and this one would be kind of closer for a like preteen girl um so that size I'm really curious. One of the questions I've always wondered when I've seen this kind of beading is, is each bead individually sewn down or is it on a strand? Is it like, are they how, because when you look at the line, the row of the beading and that detail picture that you have is so clear, you can truly see sort of rows of lines of beads. And so I'm really curious about, I've never been able to hold one and look at the back. So I'm curious about the technique of the beading in this. Yeah, so there's two kind of techniques with lane stitching. Um, so lane stitching is with one string. Um, it's tied on the back. And so you come from the back, you load your beads, and then you come down and tack it and come back up again, if that makes sense. Yes, so each one sense. individually is, is a row that's loaded um, on, on, I guess, kind of like a column is the best way of explaining that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so with different hides, there's kind of different techniques. Some people will choose to go all the way through every dermis of the hide, while others will choose to go halfway through the dermises. And so the stitch actually ends up being um, uh, cushioned in between the back and, and the top of the hide. Um, and so I don't exactly know how this one is. Um, line stitching is incredibly hard to do because it's hard to keep them straight. Um, a lot of times it's a natural, um, tendencies of our hand, sometimes lane stitching will curve. And so you can see just how perfectly aligned each one of these um, these, these rows is. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, it's really great. And especially where that curve, the, the detail that you have of the curve, how the intentionality of the beading beautifully merges into it, um, into the sort of that crescent or that triangular shape, that point that comes down. And it's really incredible. Um, and so to kind of give you an idea of the construction specifically of this dress, um, a fully women's beaded dress like the horse dress I was showing, um, I've been told that they take three full animal hides. 
So mm -hmm. one hide for the front of the dress, one hide for the back of the dress, and then one more for the cape. And they actually overlock them like this. Uh, and so that's where the neckline comes from. Gotcha. So to kind of give you an idea of um, just the construction size. Um, okay, so then this one is a also a Lakota coat. Um, and it's, it's showing, it's a women's art piece, but it's showing the motifs of men. And so you can see that they have a little bit different representational art than the TP that we showed earlier. Again, this concept of a horse and rider and navigating the plains, those themes mm -hmm. come up. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit about what we do um, in terms of exhibition design and consultation. Um, so this is an exhibition that we just um, changed out this spring. Um, you can, so this is a, a parade rider from the Crow tribe. Um, and I actually consulted with my own grandma to do this one. So <laughs> uh, my grandma picked every color and I sent her pictures and she said, that's not put on there. You need to straighten out the, the stirrup. So we fixed the stirrup on the horse. And um, so like having those, those tribal connections and those ties is really important. Um, what you can see is just kind of the work it takes um, to work with these kind of organic materials. Um, so the dress itself, we had to retrofit the mount, the terracotta mount, to make sure that it fit um, perfectly and we padded the dress out. Um, and so my first slide was actually the dress that we were showing, the elk tooth dress, and then you could see uh -huh. it in, in function. I have a question. Like, so, okay, let's talk about terracotta mounts later, but I love that. And I, those mount, the mounts that you have are absolutely stunning. They're really gorgeous. How in the world with a terracotta mount did you get this dress on that? I mean, that's what's blowing my mind right now because, yeah. and, and on a horse, and on a horse. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so getting it on a horse was one thing that was quite were really, really fun. Um, so what was neat about the, the terracotta um, design for this is that the terracotta actually ends at the collarbone line and then the body itself is soft, soft mounted. Gotcha. Um, so that one is padded out, soft mounted, very similar to like, right, like how our tummies are right now. Um, and then the arms itself actually detached from the socket. And so we were able to open up the um, sleeve and then uh, put the arm through and then hook it on with a bolt. And then we would lightly, to get it sitting, um, we just made two small folds in the back. So it made it sit naturally. And then um, that's how we were able to have her dress. And so actually technically the top of her dress then um, ha hit at the top of her knee where, where it was mounted like that. So. As I, went through, as I went through the museum and the and the exhibit, I was like, "These like what are these what are these mannequins made of?" Uh, it was so breathtaking. I'd never seen anything like that. And now and so and then thinking about how did you? I literally walked around one that was I think it was in the center of the room. I walked around it trying to figure out like, did you open a seam somewhere? How did you get like? How did you like? It is witchcraft that you do in order to get those on. It was amazing. Yeah, it really is, and that that's a lot of the consideration that it took when we were um, changing out this mount was we actually needed to find a dress that had a wide enough collar so that we weren't causing too much stress. Because um, you have to consider, right, like. 90% of these objects are on rest all of the time, really similar to the storage that we mm -hmm. use oh, with this, right? Like this is flat mounted. And so the top is so heavy, which is why it's it's laying flat on the bottom. And then the, the bottom of the fold will be folded over. Yeah. Because we don't want to put the heavy part on this and then end up with a crease. Yep. Um, so in considering how we were going to to mount this we, we picked one that had a wide collar um that also would fit the shoulder of the terracotta because it's you know much easier to pad shoulders out than it is to to, to take stuff from the mount away so yeah, that's a part yeah. of that design element that we work with our production team um we work with our conservator we have a um a staff conservator who's absolutely phenomenal and she's she's an expert in um three-dimensional and two-dimensional art she doesn't do textiles, which or she does textiles, but surprisingly, um, there's few textile conservators in the world, which is really interesting. 
Um, so she'll, so she does a lot of bead stabilization for us because that's usually um, what the case is. But we have to consider because we, we work with objects of organic material, just like us, they're, they're meant to age. And so that is the conversation that we have of like, when we do a conservation intervention, you know, is yep. this taking away from the life, the life ways um, in the natural, or if the intervention needs to happen because it's something that humans have um, have done. So those are all part of those conversations. So I definitely invite you to come and view, um, visit us at the Plains Indian Museum. Um, I wanted to just show this picture to show just kind of the breadth of many tribal nations that we represent and we consult and work with. Um, we had an advisor who saw this picture and he goes, oh, that's like the Imelda Marcos of Plains Indian moccasins. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the nations that are represented um, in this, uh, this circle are Dakota with the florals on the right. Um, we have Crow with the florals on the bottom. Um, a Nakota to the left of that. Um, this one is Oto. Um, so the, the motif on the far left and then um, Comanche moccasins and there's some Lakota moccasins there as well and then the children's moccasins because you know we all need footwear um so again i want to say aho thank you that's how you say um aho kashtila in my nation um and then this is my contact information so yeah well, right now i'm um super super duper grateful to be included um in this series and would love to answer any questions if you have some. So I'll start with a few questions and get things going. Like, how yeah. can people come and do research with you? Absolutely. Um, so there's a few components. Um, we have um, a fellowship program, so you can do formal fellowship research. Oh, um, to that. So if you if you come from like academic background and you're looking for that kind of fellowship credential, we have um, a portal that you're able to do so. I believe we do fellowships one time a year. Um, that said, with advanced research, we have a kind of non-formal process um, where individuals who may not be in academia may want to do research, and so you can put a research proposal in with us, um, and then we take it up the ladder to our advisory board and, and make sure that the project is within, um, is culturally sensitive. Um, we're not looking for individuals who are trying to appropriate um, parts of, of the, the collections that we create or that we, we steward, of course, um, recognizing that we house regalia, we don't house costume. Um, and so, you know, costume is this idea that you dress up and play a role. Um, travel people do not do that. You know, we, we live who we are every single day. So, yeah, actually, that term costume, we, we as costume society debate quite a bit because it has such a long history and means many different things. Um, and so we, you know, so we, we have that ongoing conversation um, like all the time. So um, that's amazing. How long is the fellowship that you support? Um, I believe the fellowships have to be completed within a year. Uh, most people will do them and they'll come and do like three, two to three weeks of research. Um, and so I believe the stipend, half of the stipend is issued then. Um, and then once you produce whatever content you're going to create, whether that be a book or a paper, or um, I guess in this case, it would probably be a three dimensional item, then the rest of it will be awarded. Um, and there is a fellowship um, advisory council that we, we issue oh. that will read all those proposals. So. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, and I can share that information with you, Leon, to, to share with um, the, the consortium here. Um, you said you were going to share a list of contemporary designers. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and the um, reason I ask that is last year at CSA, I'm, I'm, I'm about to share with you, Hunter, two of my most prized possessions um, that I okay. purchased last year um, at CSA. Um, and some of my friends who were with me are in the chat. So um, we had, uh, we were in uh, Salt Lake City and uh, uh, Kota Bear, who uh, represents, you're nodding your head. So Kota Bear was there um, selling some jewelry for many uh, different um, in, uh, native artists. And so I was able to purchase this stunning, 
Oh my god, look at the hishi beads on that. Oh my god, it's so wow. huge. I can't wait to talk to you about this. Um it's designed by Jolene Bird. Oh my gosh, look at that. This is uh, a spiny oyster that has been polished and shaved and is designed is by Corey and Paul Coriza. I whenever I wear these, um uh people are like, What is that? And I saw them and I was like, I have to get these and and i went through this whole conflict of like can i buy and wear this jewelry obviously they're here wanting me wanting people to buy and wear this jewelry so i'm gonna buy and wear this jewelry and they're heavy i mean yeah this this necklace it's a statement, it's a statement to wear something like that I mean, this, you know i'm used to having the biggest <laughs> earrings in the room so you know this is it, it's every time i wear them people are are just like what are you wearing? What is that? Oh, I love it. And I love it so much. The shell necklace, what I love so much is the random piece of turquoise that is on mm. this. It's so, it's this wonderful little amuse-bouche or, you know, or folly on a necklace in a way that I just I love. No, and I, and I love that because, you know, we, this is a conversation that happens a lot, and it's not just with, you know, Native people, but many cultural individuals is like, you know, where do you bridge the line between cultural appropriation, cultural appreciation, and cultural integration, right? Like, those are three very specific backgrounds, and so, right, like, if you are purchasing, I, I you know, something that uh, was a, a conversation that happened recently was, Wrangler um, teamed up with, oh my gosh, what is her name? She's a jeweler. I heard about this. Kind of a famous jeweler and decided that they were going to produce this line of ready to made turquoise inspired, Southwestern inspired turquoise pieces with the Wrangler blah, blah, blah collaboration. And the Western art community, the Western fashion community said, Wrangler, what is wrong with you? They're like, if you are going to do something like this, like purchase it directly from indigenous jewelers. There's so many out there who are creating phenomenal art. And it was really interesting because I was like reading this whole conversation and watching TikToks about this and people were not happy and so you know you have many communities who are also saying kendra scott thank you yes yes catherine kendra scott like and she's you know right world famous and and they're like what is going on here and so the the western influencers are saying like no we're not buying into this and i don't know if it's still up there but i can imagine that wrangler probably didn't probably did not do very good uh, um there was um who I'm trying to remember where that where I was. Um, mm, 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 mm. It might so I grew up in South Dakota, and um, and I was recently uh, last year or so I visited a collection in South Dakota of native artifacts and and one of the native archives and they were, I forgot this artist's name and they were talking about how this artist had started to take. Um, she's a designer started to take kind of western clothes um like shoes and hats and do the seed beating on do the line beating on them in order to create it and they had some of her work really like you know local designer uh and amazing absolutely amazing to look at a baseball cap that had been seed beaded with the with with the in in the in the line beating way just absolutely stunning it was like oh my gosh where is like and they were like yes we just had a native fashion show when we purchased these two pieces to go into the collection to to support it so it was really amazing i think it was at um the pine tree reservation um archives oh. Yeah. Well, and I think that was like the perfect approach to, you know, navigating this idea of cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. Let me rephrase that cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. And that like when you're purchasing directly from native artists, native fashion designers, you are acting in that consent informed transaction that I talked about a little bit ago. And so they are 
producing something that they are saying is for you and it's for everyone right yeah. and if they were producing something that it wasn't for you then that would explicitly be stated yeah. And so that is, I think, the best way to navigate this system. Um, and when I got, what is it? When I got, this is a joke. So when I got the bill, I don't know how consent informed it was because. <laughs> but I was like, but I mean, you can say Leon that you have something that is one of a kind, right? Absolutely. Like, imagine yeah. how many of those things were like Lee, Kendra Scott and Wrangler were were mass producing. Like, there's yeah. thousands of those. Yeah. No one I've else never, is going to have something like that. Yeah, I've never ever seen anything like these. Um, as a costume designer, when I look at so many different histories and and all the books that we all own, I was just like, I've never ever seen anything like it. And so I was like, uh, but it was it's just they're my prized possessions right now. Oh my gosh, I, and I love that you took them all the way to Minnesota to. So I hope wear them at your conference, but then to also present them here, that's that's the best. Oh, I take them whenever, like literally whenever I get on the on an airplane and travel somewhere, they get safely packed away in my luggage so mm -hmm. I can wear them. I wear them all the time. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say, too, is that we take these same lessons, right, these exact same lessons in consent and form transactions, and we can apply that to other people. Right? Like we should be purchasing from African American artists, we should be purchasing from Latin mean artists, we should be doing this with Asian artists. And so, you know, it's not just that that lesson of culturally informed, culturally competent collection and um, purchasing should should be universal, right? It should be universal. And so those people should be the ones that are advocating, should be the ones that are receiving the business because that directly stops, you know, this this mass-produced crap that we you know see over and over again yeah um Hunter, we have come to our time sadly i know i could talk to you guys all night long so um, i can't wait to talk you... so we will we will certainly be in touch and uh i can't wait to see more of your work and to revisit and to visit cody again um and um yes so thank you for this amazing presentation today it's just wonderful and a really interesting way of seeing uh, exhibition from from a different lens and how to do it. It was just spectacular. Um, so thank you. Thank you, so you. Um, and can I just make one last minute statement? Um, thank you for those that took the time to to include their life and to include their experiences in the chat and to share those parts of, of your experience. Um, Again, a one hour session is never enough to accomplish all the things that we want to do, but I'm really happy to see that there's so many backgrounds and so many people that were willing to participate in that way. Um, communication is ultimately the most important part. And so um, for you to, to put your life force and your time into that, I think is really, I'm really grateful. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, please thank Hunter Old Elk for her amazing presentation and her effort. Thank you for attending. Please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure you hear about all of our upcoming episodes in the series Conversations on Dress. Um, and with that, thank you all so much. Have a great evening wherever you are, and please stay safe.